Hi, I'm Stan Brown. Welcome to this short illustrated talk on light. My own interest in science was sparked when, as a child, I got my first telescope and saw the moons of Jupiter. I'm fascinated by light, and in my career as a scientist, I've seen it used in a host of practical applications. Light is a very big subject. In this talk, I can only touch briefly on some of the topics within it. And hopefully, I can avoid making light heavy going. We are surrounded by light, by day, and even less perceptibly by night. We see it, and we feel it as it can move us spiritually and emotionally. We use light as a philosophical and spiritual metaphor, with phrases such as the age of enlightenment, let there be light, a candle in the dark, light at the end of the tunnel. And the absence of light, darkness, can sometimes be unsettling. We marvel at the ghostly light of the moon. And on a sunny day, at the richness of colour it shows to us. We see light created in a blinding flash from out of the darkest clouds. Light has been explored in art for centuries, of course, as in the chiaroscuro style of Caravaggio, or the impressionism of artists such as Turner, Van Gogh, or Monet. But what actually is light? We are all familiar with sunshine, moonlight, candles, flames, torches and electric bulbs. We know of fibre optic broadband, of infrared cameras and of creatures that glow in the dark depths of the sea. Rarely though do most of us think of the much larger reality beyond the visible or of the underlying nature of light itself. Let's see if we can use the underlying properties of light to link, in this short talk, the colours of flickering flames. The lights of a city at night. With the vastness of a distant galaxy. Light is the fastest thing in the universe at 186,000 miles per second. Its speed, the C in Einstein's equation E equals mc squared, explains nuclear power and the energy of stars. Strange as it may seem, we'll start our explanation of light with a small flat magnet. Note the invisible lines of force of the magnetic field linking its north and south poles. You can make these lines visible using iron filings, but rest assured that they do actually exist. In contrast to the magnet's magnetic field, let's now look at the invisible lines of force for the electric field of a battery. It is this field that provides the voltage or electromotive force that propels electrons as electric current through a wire when connected to both ends of the battery. Now the battery has been set on top of three disc magnets stacked to make the magnetic field stronger and a copper wire has been bent to make a connection between the positive and the negative ends of the battery. The electric field of the battery is making an electric current flow in the same direction through both arms of the wire. It is clear that some force is acting on the wire which wasn't there before we made the connection and that it is acting horizontally. The spinning of the wire is explained by the interaction of the electric and magnetic fields as they cut across each other. A force F in the diagram is produced which acts on the wire and is, interestingly, at right angles to both the other fields. And by the way, the direction of current flowing in this diagram is for historical reasons shown as from positive to negative. This so-called conventional current is of course opposite in direction to the actual flow of electrons. But the principle is the same. This fundamental property of nature is known as electromagnetism and was discovered and explained in the 19th century by the work of Ersted, Faraday, Maxwell, Hertz, Fleming and others. This relationship shown in the diagram to the right is known as Fleming's left-hand rule and forms the basis of the electric motor.
In the last slide, we saw an electric field and a magnetic field producing motion. In this video, we provide only the motion and the magnetic field. There is no battery. A magnet is moved up close to a coil of wire connected to a meter, which measures electric voltage. The strength of the magnet's field increases as it gets closer to the coil, and as it does so, a voltage, and therefore a current, are generated. Similarly, as the magnet is taken away, the magnetic field decreases, and a current in the opposite direction is generated. Note, though, that when the magnet is stationary, there is no voltage. This phenomenon is known as electromagnetic induction and was first discovered by Michael Faraday in 1831. This relationship is known as Fleming's right-hand rule and is the basis of the dynamo or electric generator. Our modern world could not exist without it. As we have just seen, the directions of the force causing the movement of the electric field and of the magnetic field are at right angles to each other. It only takes two of the three to produce the third, which means that a wire carrying an electric current through a magnetic field will experience a force, and this is how an electric motor works. A wire moved through a magnetic field, or vice versa, will produce a current, and this is how a dynamo or generator works. Instead of physically moving, a changing magnetic field will be enough to create or induce a changing electric field, and vice versa. This is how light works. It is created when an accelerating electric charge creates a moving electric field. Once the electron has stopped accelerating, its electric field rapidly collapses and induces a magnetic field at right angles, which itself then rapidly collapses, inducing an electric field, which then collapses, and so on and so on. The two linked fields propagate or move through space at 300 million meters per second in a direction at right angles to both of them. This velocity was calculated by the famous Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell, and then confirmed by actual measurement of the speed of light. The waves carry energy but not matter as they move. Nothing material is vibrating. There is no electric current carried by electrons and there's no overall electric charge, just the two fields. The wave carries on at the same speed essentially forever, unless it interacts with something that can absorb its energy. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, for anything moving at the speed of light, time, as far as it is concerned, stands still. So a photon of light from a galaxy at the far side of the universe arrives here instantly from its perspective if it had one, but from ours it has taken over 12 billion years. The waves of light exist in separate packages or particles of energy called photons. A photon is both a wave and a particle. It chooses to be one or the other depending on how we detect and measure it. Some experiments show it to be a wave and other experiments a particle. This is known as wave-particle duality. Each of the photons carries a quantum, or certain precise amount of energy. This world of quantum physics can't be explained in everyday terms of our human experience. Common sense does not work here. Maths is the only way to explain and predict what happens at the quantum level, and some things cannot be explained in terms of anything simpler than themselves. All electromagnetic waves move through space with velocity, wavelength and frequency. The velocity of light in a vacuum is 300 million meters per second. The distance between the crests of the waves is the wave wavelength lambda. The number of crests passing any fixed point per second is the frequency nu. The velocity is the length of each wave multiplied by the number of waves per second, or mathematically c equals nu lambda. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength and vice versa. The energy carried by a photon is proportional to its frequency. According to the simple but very profound formula, E equals H nu, where H is Planck's constant. In other words, the energy of light is greater, the higher the frequency. At any one frequency, the energy is precisely defined. The full range of possible frequencies, from the fastest to the slowest, or of wavelengths from the shortest to the longest, is called the electromagnetic spectrum. The diagram shows the range or spectrum of all electromagnetic radiation. It's on a logarithmic scale and is in reality much, much wider than it appears in the diagram. At the far left, gamma rays have a frequency a million, 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 million times higher and an equally shorter wavelength than long radio waves at the far right. Because energy is proportional to frequency, E equals H nu, 
A gamma ray's energy is also a million, 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 million times higher than that of long radio waves. Note in this diagram how visible light is only a tiny section of the overall spectrum. Its wavelength ranges from 318 nanometers to 750 nanometers. A nanometer is a billionth of a meter. Our eyes have evolved to see this range only, partly because of the type and temperature of the star which we orbit. At shorter wavelengths than 380 nanometers, we enter the ultraviolet, whilst at wavelengths longer than 750 nanometers, we start the infrared. Everything outside this narrow window is invisible to our eyes. Reality is indeed much, much deeper than it appears. Luckily, science has given us the ability through technology to see the entire spectrum. Light is produced by accelerating charged particles. For example, let's look at TV and radio broadcasts. In a radio or TV transmitter, the charged particles, or electrons, are accelerated up and down the aerial at certain frequencies by passing electric current through it. The current has lots of information, such as sound or picture, encoded in it as a modulation. The coding can be done by varying or modulating the frequency of the carrier signal as in frequency modulated, or FM radio, or by modulating its amplitude, as in AM radio. TV is broadcast on FM. The transmitter causes the broadcast signal to propagate from the transmitter as light, which, as it is in the radio part of the spectrum, is invisible to our eyes. As the signal crosses TV receiving aerials on our roofs miles away, the electrons in the aerials are accelerated by the passing electromagnetic fields, and a current is induced, which is a replica of that in the transmitter. This is then decoded and amplified by the circuits in our TV, which reproduces the picture and sound encoded in the original modulated signal. Different channels are on slightly different frequencies. Exactly the same principle is also used in satellite TV broadcasts. Because of their relatively long wavelengths, Radio waves can often penetrate solid objects, such as walls and people. Wi-Fi is also a radio wave, as is Bluetooth, and the mobile phone signals of 3, 4 or 5G. Without perceiving it with our senses, we are constantly bathed in a wide range of radio waves. And we all have been, not just since radio, TV, radar, Wi-Fi and so on were invented, but since the formation of the Earth. As the Sun, like all stars, also transmits radio waves, which can penetrate our atmosphere. Radio waves don't have enough energy to ionise an atom or molecule and are therefore called non-ionising radiation. This means that they don't cause mutations in our DNA. This is the dish of the radio telescope at Jodrell Bank. The blue inset is a false colour image of the sun at radio frequencies. Here is another example of light being produced by accelerating charged particles. We can envisage an atom in simple terms as having a positively charged nucleus, positive because it contains protons, orbited by negatively charged electrons. This simplified solar system model of the atom is good enough to explain how light is emitted and absorbed by atoms. The electrons are in a series of orbits or shells around the nucleus. The electrons in the shells closest to the nucleus are more strongly attracted by it. To lift an electron up one shell requires energy to do work against the attraction of the electric field. Just like lifting a weight up one step of the stairs requires energy to do work against the attraction of the gravitational field. To lift an electron up two or three shells requires more energy. In each of the 92 naturally occurring elements found in the universe, there is a different number of protons in the nucleus and an equal number of electrons in the shells around it. This means that the electron shells in each element differ in number and in the energy difference between those shells. If energy is injected into an electron in a lower shell or energy level, it can absorb that energy and jump up one, two or more energy levels. This is known as atomic absorption. Conversely, if there are spaces free in lower energy levels, electrons can fall down one, two or more energy levels. 
And as they do so, they are an accelerating electric charge, and therefore they emit electromagnetic radiation, or in other words, light. This is known as atomic emission. The energy of the light emitted is exactly equal to the difference between the energy levels through which the electrons fell, which means a specific wavelength or frequency of light is emitted for each type of electron transition, whether from shell 6 to shell 2 or shell 4 to shell 1, etc. etc. Each different element therefore has a set or pattern of different wavelengths of light belonging to it and to it alone. And this is known as the atomic emission spectrum of that element. For an electron to jump up one or more shells, it must absorb exactly the right amount of energy for that particular transition, whether from shell 2 to shell 3 or shell 1 to shell 4, etc. One possible source of that energy is a photon of light at exactly the right frequency. Similarly, if an electron falls down one or more shells, it must emit exactly the right amount of energy as a photon. The photon's energy is exactly equal to the difference between the energy levels through which the electron fell. As we go up through the elements from the simplest hydrogen with just one electron to helium with two and on to the heavier and heavier elements, the number of electrons increases as the number of protons in the nucleus increases. This means an increasing number of electron shells and therefore energy levels. The greater positive charge of the heavier nuclei pulls more strongly on their electron shells. This, together with a different number of shells and the partial shielding by the inner shells of the nucleus's pull on the outer shells, means that the pattern of energy levels is different for every element. In other words, a unique atomic barcode exists for each element. This fact allows us to identify the presence and concentration of the 92 chemical elements, both here on Earth and across the universe, by analysing their emission or absorption spectra. This widely used tool of science is known as spectroscopy. Every element in the periodic table can be analysed in this way. In each of these flickering flames, there is a different metallic element present, with the exception of the fourth from the left, which is methanol, made only of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, and the fifth, which is a compound of boron. Skipping methanol, which is an almost colourless flame, we can see the unique colours of the elements. Indium, cesium, rubidium, boron, copper, sodium, barium, calcium, strontium and lithium. You can do this easily yourself by sprinkling table salt, safely of course, into a flame. The special colour of sodium will instantly appear in the flame. The human eye can only discern a little information from the overall colour, but we can much more precisely analyse it using an instrument known as a spectrometer to spread out the light like a rainbow into a detailed spectrum. The absorption spectrum for hydrogen is shown at the top of this image. First note the continuous spectrum, the familiar rainbow of colours. This is produced by a very hot object such as the sun radiating white light at all the visible wavelengths. If light were to pass through, say, cool hydrogen gas, some specific wavelengths, which have exactly the right energy, will cause electrons in the hydrogen atoms to absorb them and jump up to a higher energy level. These wavelengths are therefore subtracted from the continuous spectrum and appear as black lines on it. This is an absorption spectrum. The exact opposite occurs when hydrogen gas is excited by heat, light or fast moving charged particles, which forces the electrons to jump to higher levels. When they fall back down to the empty spaces in the lower levels, light is emitted at the very same wavelengths corresponding to the energy difference between the levels. This creates the emission spectrum for hydrogen. At the top again is the continuous spectrum of white light. Beneath are the visible spectra of four different elements. Although some lines and some elements appear almost identical, like for example the blue lines of hydrogen and calcium, at higher resolution they will be different. 
Other lines may also be present beyond the visible range at either end of the spectrum. Spectroscopy is a powerful technique for detecting and identifying elements by analysing their spectra, either emission or absorption. The familiar orange streetlights in our towns and cities use low pressure sodium vapour excited by high voltage. The lines in the yellow orange range of its spectrum are the most dominant. Because there is no blue light present, there is little scattering of the light and fog. Scattering is the reason the sky is blue. Most objects lose their colour when viewed under sodium lamps. Lamps using other elements such as neon are of course used for specific lighting purposes. Infrared radiation is a region of the spectrum of light invisible to our eyes. We can though feel it as heat on our skin and we can visualise it through special cameras. It is lower in energy and longer in wavelength than visible light. It is primarily absorbed and emitted, not by electrons jumping into different shells and atoms, but by the vibration of the electronic bonds between atoms and molecules as they stretch, twist or bend. A key concept here is resonance. It is only when the swing is pushed at the same frequency as the natural frequency of the swing itself, as a pendulum, that the energy of the push is absorbed. Notice in the ethanol molecule animation at the bottom how absorption of infrared radiation for each different type of movement occurs at a specific wavelength. Infrared spectroscopy is widely used in various forms in analytical laboratories all over the world. It can help distinguish one chemical compound from another or even help determine the structure of a previously unknown molecule. Infrared spectrometers scan the sample to be analysed across a range of wavelengths. The intensity of the absorption at each wavelength is recorded on the machine's integrated computer to give a spectrum as shown on the screen. The spectrum for ethanol above shows the specific modes of vibration and therefore absorption of the different chemical bonds within the molecule, such as carbon-hydrogen stretch. Also of use in analysing chemical compounds is ultraviolet visible spectroscopy and most analytical laboratories would have both IR and UV machines, sometimes combined with other types of instruments. Both techniques are also used in astronomy. Fluorescence is another type of absorption and emission of light, which we often see at concerts and children's parties. Objects that fluoresce appear brighter than they normally would because invisible ultraviolet light from sunlight or from special UV lamps excites the electronic bonds in their molecules. Instead of re-radiating the same wavelength back again, the bonds release their excess energy in two stages rather than one. The result is that some of the energy is re-emitted as visible light at a lower energy than the ultraviolet, which makes the object seem to glow even in low ambient visible light conditions. Fluorescent brightening agents in detergents are one way to make a shirt even more brilliant white. Phosphorescence is a delayed fluorescence, where the glow continues for a while, seconds or sometimes hours, after the ultraviolet light source is removed. It is seen in many rocks and minerals. Chemiluminescence is when light is produced by the energy released from a chemical reaction. Bioluminescence is chemiluminescence, but by a living organism. Bioluminescence occurs widely in marine vertebrates and invertebrates, in plankton, some fungi and bacteria, and in terrestrial arthropods such as fireflies. So, if glowing light from an object disappears immediately when the illumination is switched off, it's fluorescence. If it lingers for a while, it's phosphorescence. And if it needs a chemical reaction, it's chemiluminescence. If a life form does it, it's bioluminescence. Using a variety of wavelengths of light to photograph, examine and investigate objects is known as multispectral imaging. The technology of manipulating light is called photonics and has many real world applications. One of these is in forensic science. In these examples, we see infrared and visible light images of the two halves of the same black t-shirt. The infrared eliminates the black dye of the shirt and shows only the crime stains. In forensic science, infrared cameras can reveal clues, such as in this case bloodstains, that would have been invisible to the eye 
or to a normal camera. Similarly, invisible fingerprints, known as latent prints, are made visible in forensic labs by reacting fluorescent dyes with superglue vapour on the object and then shining an ultraviolet light. The fluorescent image obtained is then photographed or matching against the prints of the crime suspects. Iridescence is the often beautiful phenomenon of certain surfaces that display rainbow patterns or appear to gradually change colour as the angle of view or the angle of illumination changes. Examples include soap bubbles, feathers, butterfly wings, seashells and certain minerals. In all these examples, there is either a thin transparent layer such as oil and water, the walls of a bubble, the coating of a DVD or mother of pearl, or in the case of the butterfly wings and bird feathers, there are a closely packed series of evenly spaced reflecting surfaces. In either case, the principle is the same. Light reflecting off the upper or closer surface has a shorter distance to travel than light ref reflecting off the lower surface. If the two rays, after being reflected, travel together towards the eye of the viewer, their waves may be either in step or out of step, depending on the extra distance travelled, compared to the wavelength of the light itself. At some angles of viewing, colours, that is wavelengths of light that are in step, will constructively interfere with each other and appear bright, whilst other colours will destructively interfere or cancel each other out. Normal light coming from multiple sources is a jumble of waves vibrating in different planes. However, light reflecting off some surfaces such as water or metal, but not mirrors, is polarised as it reflects. This means that the waves are converted to be in one plane. Some chemicals in transparent solids, including some polymers or plastics, have their molecules arranged in parallel like a very fine grid. And these will allow the passage of light waves vibrating in a plane aligned to that grid, but not to others. This is the principle behind Polaroid sunglasses and polarising filters on cameras. On the left, we see how a polarising filter on the camera eliminates much of the glare of the water surface and allows us to see into the water more clearly. On the right, we see how simply rotating Polaroid sunglasses through 90 degrees reveals how the screen of an iPad emits polarised light. Although not shown here, the plane of polarisation of light can be rotated by passing it through a solution of an optically active chemical compound such as a sugar. Some compounds rotate clockwise and some rotate anti-clockwise. Less of a quick look at fibre optics. Just like radio waves, other types of light can also be made to carry information. In fact, across the electromagnetic spectrum, the higher the frequency, the more bandwidth there is for carrying information. Compared to copper wires carrying electrical signals or to radio waves, higher frequency light can carry more information faster and has two other advantages. The signal can't leak, can be picked up by eavesdroppers, it is more secure and it can't cause sh short circuits or sparks, which might be dangerous in some environments. The best frequency of light for sending down fiber optic tape cables also depends on the transparency of the glass that the cables are made from. The silica glass used for the cables is so pure that a solid block 5 kilometres thick would be as transparent as a window pane. Infrared light is the best part of the spectrum to use for fiber optic purposes. The term laser is an acronym for light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation. The various types, the first one invented being a maser using microwaves, but ultraviolet, infrared and visible lasers are also widely used today. Most lasers use a pumped up form of fluorescence inside a special material, such as a ruby crystal, to create a narrow and very intense beam of light. This light has two important properties. It is monochromatic, meaning it consists of just one wavelength, and it is coherent, meaning all the waves are in step. Some types of lasers are, in addition, polarised. The electric fields of all the photons are in the same plane. Because the photons are in lockstep with each other, they don't spread out like a normal light beam. A laser beam hitting the moon, over a quarter of a million miles away, has a diameter of only four miles. The beams can also carry a very large amount of energy and can cut through metal. The latest laser cutters focus 6 kilowatts of energy on a point of diameter less than 0.025 millimetres, as you can see in the video at the bottom left. 
Lasers can, like other types of light, also carry information. A recent James Bond-like development is the transmission of a voice message by a safe, low-energy laser beam directly to the ear of an individual in a crowd. The laser vibrates water molecules very near the person's ear to produce a sound that only they can hear. The most powerful laser beam ever created carries a peak power of 2 trillion kilowatts for one trillionth of a second. This is equivalent to focusing all the solar energy falling in London onto the width of a human hair. The temperatures and pressures produced on special tiny targets will soon enable nuclear fusion, the energy source of the stars, to be harnessed on Earth. Once successful, nuclear fusion, as distinct from the more environmentally dangerous nuclear fission, will, pro will provide virtually limitless clean energy on Earth. All matter with a temperature above absolute zero emits thermal radiation. This is due to the thermal motion of its particles, which accelerates and oscillates its electrical charges, and thus, as we have seen, produces electromagnetic radiation. The peak energy emitted is at shorter wavelengths, the higher the temperature. Whilst cooler objects, such as a human, emit largely in infrared, very hot objects will show peak emissions in the visible part of the spectrum. This is seen, for example, in molten iron in a foundry, as in the image at the bottom left but also in the colour of stars, as shown on the right. The more massive the star, the higher its temperature, the bluer its colour, and the shorter its life. If in a water bath we pass a single wave through two adjacent slits, we see a pattern of interference from the two waves emerging from the slits. Where the crests of the waves coincide, they reinforce each other, and we have constructive interference. But where the crests and the troughs coincide, we have destructive interference. The main variables here are the wavelength of the wave hitting the slits and the distance between the slits. As light is also a wave, this very same principle applies, and it was used by Rosalind Franklin in 1952 to help confirm the structure of DNA, which is one of the most important scientific discoveries of all time. In this case, the extremely short wavelengths of light she used were in the X-ray region of the spectrum, and the slits were the spacing between the coils of the helical molecule of DNA. Once Franklin and her colleagues knew the spacing using this X-ray crystallography technique, they could calculate what the molecule structure must be. The Doppler effect is well known in the case of sound. Especially when a vehicle at constant speed approaches you, then passes and drives away. In the electromagnetic wave equivalent, the Doppler shift of microwave radar is used in police speed traps to catch offending motorists. The principle of the Doppler shift is the shortening of the wavelength of a wave emanating from an object approaching us, and conversely, its lengthening as it recedes. It is in astronomy used to measure the speed of stars or galaxies moving towards us, whose visible spectra will shift towards the blue or away from us, which causes a red shift. It's even possible to measure the speed of rotation of a suitably aligned star as one half is effectively moving towards us as it spins, whilst the other half is receding. This causes the spectral lines to become spread out with a combined blue and red shift and thus become thicker. The properties of the electromagnetic spectrum are also of great use in satellite observation of Earth. When multispectral imaging cameras detect pollution, moisture in the soil, geology, land use, vegetation and plant disease, etc. from orbit. Increasingly, drones can also deploy similar technology for even higher resolution mapping. The images below show digital false colour maps of nitrogen dioxide levels in the air above northern Italy before and after the COVID-19 lockdown. Multispectral imaging is also very useful to astronomers, as each different band of wavelengths can reveal detail not seen in the others. These images are of the Crab Nebula in the constellation Taurus. It is a remnant of a cataclysmic supernova explosion recorded by Chinese astronomers in 1054. Today, it is the brightest source of both X-ray and gamma-ray radiation in the sky. In 2019, the highest energy gamma rays ever recorded 
were detected coming from the nebula. Their wavelengths were an absolutely astonishing 100 million million millionth of a metre, which is equivalent to a frequency of 10,000 million 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 hertz. We've been talking so far about the objectively measurable properties of light using instruments, as well as our eyes. However, our own personal view of reality is not only constrained by our eyes' ability to see only a very limited part of the electromagnetic spectrum, it is also constructed by our brain. Vision is in effect a mental simulation and interpretation of electrical signals generated by light hitting our retinas and travelling along nerves to the back of our heads. These three images, if you look at them, all appear to be moving in some way. But they're not. To make matters worse, the images focused on our retina are actually upside down. Well, I hope you have found this short presentation on light interesting. And as I said at the start, hopefully it wasn't too heavy going. Goodbye and thank you for watching.